Good morning. How are you today? Welcome this morning. And uh, it's the, the official start of summer and beautiful weather. But I'm so pleased this morning that we can still gather together to worship the Lord and to know him. And I want to thank the Scots for, for just a beautiful time of worship today. They just have a sense of flow and, and just movement in God's presence. And all the songs that were sung today point to what I want to share today. The scripture that says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, or they will see God. And this is part seven of this series, believe it or not. And we're almost through with it. There's maybe one or two more. And in the previous Beatitudes, just, just to, to highlight the series, the first Beatitude dealt with our need to learn how to, how to be spiritually poor. In other words, to realize that you can't do anything without God. And then after that, you mourn over it. You mourn over your sins. You, you realize, Lord, my, my sins are over my head, like the psalmist says. I can't do this without you. And then after that, it results in meekness in the idea that you want a life of self-control and you need the Holy Spirit to help you. And after the meekness comes a hunger for righteousness. And that's why it says, blessed are those who hunger for righteousness, for they shall be fed. When you're hungry to do the right thing, it's a mark that you're growing. And then after righteousness came the idea of showing mercy to those around us. Bless, blessed are the merciful. That the more these, these beatitudes progress, the less they become about receiving from God and the more they become about giving to others what you have and what you're learning. How many of you know that the longer you're a Christian, the more God expects of you? The more he expects you to be mature and, and to grow up out of certain things in your life. And, and then we come to the, to the beatitude where he talks about, about, uh, about purity of heart. And the purity of heart is, 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 is kind of like for the mature in a sense because it's one thing to live a life that is, you know, I sin during the week and then I go to church to repent. And, and my life consists of repentance and, and holiness, repentance and holiness. And God says, I want, I want you to grow up out of that. I want you to get to the point where you don't live in sin anymore, where, where you're not, not that you're perfect, but that, that, that your, your trajectory, your heart is pointed in a direction where you don't live that way anymore. And yeah, you'll make mistakes, and yeah, you'll do wrong things, but you get back up. And, and so, so this is why the hungry, those who are, are hungry to, to know God for purity of heart, that is a sign that your Christianity, that your relationship with Jesus is growing. And so I want to frame it this way this morning. I want to kind of put it to you this way this morning. Is your Christian walk one of the hands, one of the head, or one of the heart? And, and let, let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, I, I came across this years ago, this thought that many of us, we have a Christianity of the hands. And a Christianity of the hands is the, is the kind of Christianity that says, if I do good works, if I help the poor, if I fight for justice for those who, who need it, if I march in the protests, if I, if I hold up banners, and I do all these things for people who are hurting and need, you know, need justice and all these things, then I've done my Christian duty. Th that's a Christianity of the hands. But then there's the Christianity of the head. And that's where a person makes a mental profession of Christ. They say, well, I, I, I know God. You know, I, I said the words. I, I said the sinner's prayer. I know all the doctrines of, of my church. I, I know what I believe and all these things. But yet, it hasn't really, really reached the deepest part of me, the heart. And that's why I love these songs we're singing this morning that Bernie picked because they're songs that speak of the heart, that whatever comes out of me has to come out of the deepest part of me. But then there's a Christianity that comes from the deepest part of you, and that's the, that's the heart. That's the center of who you are. Anybody can make a profession. I can't tell you how many people I run, I run into through the years who, who said to me, I believe in Jesus. I love Jesus. And when you look at their lifestyle or the, the way they're living, it's the opposite of someone who knows Jesus. Because blessed are the pure in heart. Because there's no purity in heart. And so we find that, that God focuses in this scripture not on the outside of how you look, but on the inside. Thank God. I, I, would have, I wouldn't have made it. 
I have, I have a face for radio, really, really, when you think about it. But so where does God look for purity? He doesn't look on the outside. It doesn't matter if you wear earrings or, you know, piercings and all this, even though I, I don't like that stuff. I, you know, if I had a kid, I'd say, take that stuff off, you know. But, but it, it's, it's not a matter of holiness or non-holiness. It's what's in the heart. It's what comes from your heart. Now, now kids, you, you still have to listen to your parents on that matter. I don't want to get in that one. <laughs> But God looks at the inside of you. He looks at, at what's going on inside because what's going on, on the outside doesn't always match what's going on on the inside. And Psalms 51, 6 puts it beautifully. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. That's the heart nobody else sees. Teach me wisdom in that place. Our hearts are the center of who we are. That's why... This, this beatitude comes towards the end of the beatitudes because if, if my heart is not in this, what's the point? If all I'm doing is going through the motions of Christianity and religiosity and just doing all these things just to please somebody, what's the point? Everything that I do must come from my heart or not at all. Proverbs 4.23 said, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. That's why if you want to protect your body, protect your heart. If you want to protect your purity, protect your heart. If you want to protect the, the, the part of your life that, that, that you want to be safe, you have to guard your heart because your heart is where everything happens. And if the center is whole and healthy, then the rest of you will be whole and healthy. And if the center is not whole and healthy, then the rest of you will not be whole and healthy. So when you come to think about it, your heart is the heart of the issue. Usually your biggest problem is your heart. It's not your hands. Your hands only do what your heart told us to do. If you commit a crime, they don't try your hands. They try your heart. They try your heart. Because that's where the decisions were made. Matthew 5.19 puts it beautifully. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a person. Well, what is he talking about there? Well, there was a controversy, and I think this past year we're familiar with controversies more than ever. And, and this is what was happening. Jesus' disciples were not washing their hands, and it was, it was a, a requirement that if you are a, a Jew and you attend temple, you need to wash your hands. If you don't wash your hands, you're ceremony, ceremonially unclean. So the Pharisees would look at, at Jesus' disciples and say, look at them, they're filthy, they're, they're, they're sinners, they don't even wash their hands. And so Jesus said, it doesn't matter what goes into them, it doesn't matter what's on the outside, what matters is what's from the heart. That's what God looks at. And that's why I never look at a person from the outside and say, oh, don't be disgusted at that. Because God looks at the heart. And God sees, he sees what they can be, not what they are at that moment. So Paul talked about what it means to be perfectly holy when he said this. He said, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and of spirit. You see that? Not just of the body but of the Spirit. And he says, making holiness perfect. So what, what is perfect holiness? Anybody can make a show of outward holiness and look really, really good on the outside and dress up real nice and, and be good looking and, you know, and, and, and do all of what society says. But what is their spirit like? What is on the inside? If you want to be perfectly holy, your spirit has to be holy. You have to be holy from the inside out, not from the outside in. I never agreed with the saying that the clothes make the man. Have you ever heard that saying? The clothes make the man. Wow, look at that. You know, look at that nice suit. I, I like nice clothes. I don't spend a lot on them, but I, I like nice clothes. But I realize that my clothes cannot define who I am. My heart defines who I am. And the question for Christians is the real, that the real challenge isn't defiling the body it's defiling the spirit. And we live in a world where our spirits can be defiled and we don't even know it. We don't even realize it. 
because of, of stuff we witness or see or get into or people fell, we fellowship with, we can be defiled in our... Have you ever been around people that after you were with them, you felt dirty? You felt unclean. You felt like... And it's not because you're self-righteous and you're judging them, but you just feel like something's off here, Lord. Something's not right. I'm going to pray for them. And this is what I mean by your spirit should be so sensitive that you feel that. In fact, in the Old Testament, it says that, that Noah was vexed by the evil in the world. He was tormented by the evil that he saw and felt in the world. That's a sign of a pure heart that you know that that you sense the evil around you. You feel it. Not like a self-righteous Pharisee you know, that's, that, that just judges people and says, you're going straight to hell. I don't mean like that. But what people do, even if you love them, even if your heart breaks for them, vexes you. Do you follow what I'm saying today? Yes. And what's going on in the world today should vex us more than ever. We should never get used to it. We should never get comfortable with it. We should never say it's okay. The things our hearts dwell on, hold on to, are entertained by, can defile us. They can defile the rest of us. Think about that. So what purity is not? I always like to do this in this series to show you the negative part of it, what something is not, so that I can show you what it is. Purity is not abstaining from sexual sins, that you know that. Even though, if you're pure in heart, you won't, you won't commit sexual sins. But what I'm saying this morning is that, is that if I abstain from sexual sins, it doesn't mean that I have a pure heart. That doesn't define a pure heart. A virgin is considered pure, but it's not the same as having a pure heart. Some think... If I don't commit sexual sins, if I don't lie, if I don't cheat, if I don't run around, if I don't watch pornography, I have a pure heart. And you can do all those things and have a heart that is very impure. But also, purity is not this. It's not sinless perfection. That was something that was taught by John Wesley and others. Sinless perfection, that, man, you can live perfectly. And I, you know, I, I, I read a lot of Wesley's works. I'm a huge fan of his and whether you realize it or not, our faith tradition came out of Wesley. Did you know that? Pentecostals and Baptists came out of Wesley. But I believe that sinless perfection is not how you define purity of heart. Why? What's your track record like? When's the last time you said something you shouldn't have? Thought something you shouldn't have? Was unkind to somebody? Was not gracious? Was just mean? Anyone can, can say, I don't commit all these sins. But that doesn't make me pure either. What about this one? Outward obedience. We kind of touched on that. Outward obedience is not a pure heart. Because we can be very compliant with something and yet our hearts be bitter and angry at the same time. I can obey a rule and hate the person who made the rule. Anybody can do the rules on the outside, but on the inside, something is impure in the spirit about it. That's why God told Samuel when Samuel was looking for a king, and Samuel was very taken by David's big brothers who were strong, and they were healthy, and they looked like they worked out, and they were like, wow. He's like, surely this guy's got to be the king. He's awesome. And God said, I've already rejected him. Don't even waste your time. Why? Because he was looking on the outward appearance. And then God says, the Lord doesn't look on the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. Wow. You never know. You ever see a great leader and they look like the most unassuming person ever? They don't look like this hero. They look like, you know, this quiet little person and just kind of, and they're a great person. Why? Because the outward appearance doesn't matter. But also, this morning, a pure heart is not this, an innocent personality. How many of you know people that are very pure-hearted and they make you laugh? And they could be a little flighty and funny, right? We have a dear friend who years ago, she used our, our bathroom. And uh, after she used our bathroom, she says, wow, great water pressure. It must be because you live in the falls. We said, whoa. 
But this is what I mean by pure hearted. <laughs> they just say things. And I pray she's not watching this today because I'll be in trouble because we love her. She's the greatest, truly. She's an awesome woman of God. <laughs> Highly favored of the Lord. <laughs> but how many of you know some people, are, they're flighty, they're, they're blameless, they're, they're ignorant in a way. They could be gullible to schemes and scams. If someone told them a dirty joke, they wouldn't get it. Right? If someone told them how how ugly the world is, they would be pressed to believe it. They may not believe it. Why? Because they have a pure heart, and it's beautiful. But just because they're innocent doesn't mean they're pure-hearted. I mean, we say they're pure-hearted, but that's not the same as what Jesus talked about, the pure of heart. Someone can be pure-headed, but not be pure-hearted. Those are two different things. And that's why none of those things qualify us to be people that are pure in heart. So what is purity of heart this morning? What does it mean when, when, when we are pure in heart? First, we have to define the word heart. When God speaks of the heart, what does he mean? Does he mean the, the muscle that pumps however many gallons of blood a minute? You know, No, he doesn't mean that. Not the physical heart. But, but the best definition I found is this one. The center of the human person in which the physical and the spiritual life are connected. And that's why in the Bible, when God speaks of souls, he doesn't just speak of the immaterial part of you, the part of you nobody sees, but the soul is the whole body, the whole soul, the whole mind, the whole spirit. That's the whole heart in a sense. It's all of you. Do you follow what I'm saying? That's why when you worship God, you don't just worship God inside and go, okay, I'm worshiping Jesus. Inside, man, I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing a, the funky chicken for Jesus inside, and I'm worshiping it, but you have this boring face on during worship. No, 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 no. Worship takes all of you. It takes your whole soul. It takes everything that you are. So what is purity of heart this morning? It is, number one, this, and this is the most primary thing, and Bernie sang it this morning. It's undivided focus. Have you ever wanted something so bad that nothing else mattered but that one thing? And you said, I've got to get this done. I'm so focused, nothing's going to stop me. A pure heart is not divided when it comes to serving God. Serving God is the issue. It is the focus of that life. It is the intention and purpose of that life that I'm going to serve God. Even if my whole family rejects me, I'm going to serve God no matter what. Even if the world tells me, you, you have to use all these titles for people. You have to call them them and they. You can't say him or her anymore. I'm still going to serve God. It doesn't matter. I think there are up to 60 different uh, titles now that you can call people. I don't know if you came across that yet. But. but a pure heart is not divided when it comes to serving God. Matthew 6.22 says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, and you might have the version that says if your eye is single, meaning singularly focused, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy or un, not single, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So what is your focus? It is said that when you really are interested in something, your eyes grow wide because they're, they're letting in more light so you can see better. And that's how focus happens in Jesus. That when he has your attention, your eyes grow wide in the spirit. And you say, Lord, it's all about you. This is purity of heart. Purity of heart cannot come from having a double standard or hypocrisy. It cannot come if your eye is not sing singular in focus on him. It can't come by focusing him and focusing on something else at the same time. That's why double-mindedness is a sign of impurity of heart. Did you know that? James said it. He challenged, he challenged the people he wrote to in James 4.18 because they were impure. He said this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you what? Wow. Impurity 
is double-mindedness. When my attention is not solely on Jesus, I'm double-minded, and that is, that is part of impurity. You see what I mean by, by committing a pet sin is not necessarily defined as impurity, even though, it, it, yeah, you, you got to deal with that. God has to fix that. But it's when you're double-minded, that's really impurity because you're trying to give your focus to two things at the same time, and God says, I will not compete with anything in your life. I'm either yours or I'm not. Purity of heart is also this, right motive. Anyone can do the right thing for the wrong reasons. I've seen people go to church to find a you know, spouse. Come on. I've seen people pray to God because, you know, they were desperate for an answer, but they didn't want to serve God. They just wanted the answer. Or maybe someone doesn't do the wrong thing because they're afraid of getting caught or they feel guilty or they're afraid of, of going to hell or, or they're afraid of what people will think so they won't do the wrong thing. That is not purity of heart. Purity of heart is when you do the right thing for the right motive. You do it because it pleases God and because you love him, because your focus is on him. So you're like, I'm going to do the right thing. Why would I want to please anybody else but the one I'm focusing on? So the question comes to the very center of your being. Yes, I'm a Christian, but why am I a Christian? Why do I follow him? Why do I walk the walk? Why do I fellowship with other believers? Why do I, why am I part of the Christian culture? I've known people who, who were part of the Christian culture because they thought it was very lovely and, and they loved just, you know, the holidays, the high and holy holidays and, and, and they, they, they just loved the whole, the whole Christmas thing, but they didn't know God. They had no idea who he was. But another mark of a purity of heart is this, hatred for sin. That's a big one. And it's hard for some Christians to separate this from being a mean hater of sin, if you know what I mean. A pure heart can see sin a mile away and is grieved and disgusted by it. And when I say grieved and disgusted, I don't mean where you're up here in a self-righteous way looking down on someone and saying, oh, look how filthy that sinner is. No, you're grieved because it, grieve, it grieves the heart of your father. Because he wants them to, to be in his kingdom, and they're not, and they're lost. On the other hand, an impure heart has tolerance for evil. And there are far too many Christians in our culture that just tolerate evil. They just accept it, and they don't question it. Like, it's okay. It's, it's the way the world is. And, you know, th there's no sense of, of being grieved by what they see the way Noah was where it vexes their heart, where it torments them, and they feel weighted down by the sins around them. Psalms 119 and 104 says, through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Notice he didn't say I hate every false person. I hate every false way. Why do I say that? Because sometimes we can hate people, but not the false way. And we can confuse that. So real Christians are not homophobes. Real Christians are sinophobes. Do you follow me? I'm tired of, of hearing on the news when, when, when someone says something, you know, that God made men and God made women. Well, they're homophobes. No, they're not. They're sinophobes. We believe in the Bible. We believe what God says. He defines us. And we love we love the gay community. We, we love people who, who are transgender. We love people who are different than us. Absolutely. We, we, know, we know a lot of people. We have family and all friends. We love them all. But there's always a part of us that is grieved. There's always a part of us that says, you know what? It's not supposed to be this way, Lord. You didn't create us this way, even though you love them and maintain a relationship. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? So we are sinophobes. We hate sin as God defines it. In fact, part of authentic faith is hatred for sin. Did you know that? Romans 12, 9. Let 
love be genuine. And here's how you know love is genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Genuine love hates the evil but loves the good. Love that is not genuine loves the good and is indifferent to evil. Love that is genuine, though, loves the good but hates the evil. That's the difference. That's a pure heart. And Jesus did that marvelously. He fellowshiped with everybody and anybody and loved them. But he also confronted them with the gospel and the kingdom. And we Christians, we're not here to cherry pick sins and say, well, you know, if you live that lifestyle, you're a sinner. No, if, if, if you're doing anything wrong, you're a sinner. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're lying, if, if you're embezzling money at work, you're, you're in sin. That's impurity. Number four, what is purity of heart? A hopeful view of the world. It took me years to understand that, that simple, that simple idea. That when your heart is pure, you see the world through God's eyes. Titus 1.15 says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to the corrupt and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Their very minds and consciences are corrupt. Have you ever talked to people like this? That the way they see the world is just so messed up and hopeless that you, after talking to them, you want to go home and kill yourself. <laughs> it's so depressing. And every time I do a wedding, you know, someone reads 1 Corinthians 13, love believes all things, right? You know the scripture. And we read that lightly, you know, but then you got to live it in your marriage, right? Love believes all things. What does that really mean? It means that you have a hopeful view of the world around you, that you believe the best in something before you believe the worst, the best in a person before you believe the worst. And a hopeful view is not the same as an innocent heart. It's not the same thing. An innocent heart can be ignorant about the harsh realities of the world and kind of look at the world and, and not kind of not get it, don't connect the dots. But here's the difference. A pure heart sees the ugly truth of the world and still believes in an awesome, all-powerful, overcoming God through it. That's the difference. You see the bad news, but, but you know the good news that is eternal, that is changing all things. That's why a hopeful view of the world is part of having a pure heart. When a heart has become tainted, then their world view becomes tainted. And they want to run away from all things instead of face it. But here's number five, and we're coming in for a landing slowly. A pure heart is this, a heart not dominated by desires. In our culture, that is huge. Just Our culture is, is very, very similar to the Roman culture, that you know that. The Roman culture was, was defined by living for pleasure and power. I mean, that was it. And, and, you, and you worshipped, you know, the, the Caesar, you worshipped him. And we find that purity of heart shows up in not being controlled by our desires. That's why when, when Paul witnessed to, uh, I think, Pilate, one of those, one of those uh, leaders, he talked about the world to come and self-control because that was the world they were living in. And we find that in the world we live in, unless we control our desires, our desires are going to control us and totally keep us from a pure heart. And Satan often comes in through our desires, through the things that we want. Romans 13 puts it so beautifully, is where he says the night is almost over. And, and I, I feel like this is... We're living in this moment now. The night is almost over, and the day is near. Let us, therefore, put aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as people who live in the light of day. No wild parties and drunkenness, sexual immorality, promiscuity, rivalry, or jealousy. Instead, clothe yourselves with the, with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not obey the flesh and its what? Its desires. The sentence ends with desires, and the desires he, he describes just before that, all these things he describes and more, all those things. And, and when he talks about the, the, the wild parties, in Rome, when they had wild parties, they had vomitoriums where people would eat and sit, you know, get sick, and make, you know, they'd make themselves get sick in this vomitorium and then throw back up, and then they would eat again. 
and, and their parties were marked with, with uh, sexual immorality and all these things. And so he, he's saying, the night's almost over. We need to get this right now. It's not about attending synagogue or church. It's about, is your heart pure for the moment? Are you going to be ready? Are you going to be ready for the end? Number six, and the last one, what is purity of heart? A life not controlled by possessions. Desires and possessions are two big things. And purity of heart shows up in not being controlled by the things that we own, which can happen very easily to any of us. Any of us can, can be dominated by stuff that we like. I think we've all been there where, where God just, and, and, and I think I've told you the story years ago where um, I bought a new car years ago and I, I said, man, this car is beautiful. And I was pridefully, you know, driving it and saying, look at my new car, and, you know, and uh I said, Lord, this car belongs to you. And like the next day, I got up, and there was a big scratch on the side of the door. And, and I got really in the flesh real quick. And I'm like, who did this? I'm going to, you know. And I felt like God spoke to me and said, is it still my car? Does it still belong to me? Because my possessions were, were kind of getting a hold of me instead. And when a possession controls you, there's a great sense of loss when you lose it. There's a great sense of loss of identity and loss of meaning when you lose that possession. And you don't know who you are when you lose it. That's how you know it has you. But to the pure in heart, losing a possession in this life might hurt. They might feel it. But it's not devastating. Because that thing did not have them. It was just a thing they owned. But if the pure in heart lose God's presence then they are truly lost. Because that's something you can't, you can't get by yourself unless God reveals himself to you. And that's why the pure in heart seek God. They want God. He is the only possession worth living for and dying for. He is the only possession that really matters in this life. Because everything else is going to go anyway, isn't it? Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The things you treasure, wherever your money goes to the most, that's where your heart is. Wherever your investment goes most, that's where your heart is. So there's a simple pr promise that Jesus gave to the pure in heart. And I call it this, an open revelation of God. What does that mean? It sounds fancy, but what does it mean? It means that you can see God for yourself. That with your inner spiritual eye, if you are pure in heart, you'll see him in a waking vision. You'll know him. You won't have to read books to find out who he is. You won't have to, you won't have to ask people, who is this God? You'll know him for yourself. That's why Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to know him. Why does he give this promise? Because the best way to be pure is to be with the only person who can transform you, Jesus. He's the only person that can change you. Have you ever noticed that whenever you're, whenever you hear a revelation, something that's preached or taught to you, and maybe you've been kind of like not as, not as passionate up, you know, with God and not as on fire for God, and you hear a powerful word or a powerful evangelist or someone speak a, a, a a, a rhema word on the spot where, where God just speaks to you, all of a sudden you feel a restraint coming on your life. And you feel like, you know what? I feel like maybe I've gone over here a little bit. And God's pulling me back. Anybody ever go through that? Wow. That's God pulling you back to the point where he wants you to have an open revelation of him. Because you can't change without revelation. You have to see it for yourself. And revelation isn't when someone nags at you to change. That's not revelation. That's nagging. <laughs> revelation is when God shows you. And you see it for yourself and you say, Lord, I see it now. I'm going to change. Forgive me. I close with Psalm 86, one of my favorite scriptures. I've, I preach on the scripture where he, he prays, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere 
your name. Let's stand together. We're going to pray. Thank you for being with us on this holiday. God, grant blessing on his word in your life and transforming power. May he teach us how to love what is right and hate what is wrong while still loving those who do wrong. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. Lord, forgive us for putting the wrong emphasis on what purity is. I'm thinking that purity is just not having petty sins or just it's about do's and don'ts and all these things we mentioned. Lord, teach us what it means to have a single focus. You. Teach us what it means to live for you, to orient our life around you. Not Christian culture, not even church, but you, Lord. You. That you become the first thought in the morning and the last thought in the evening. You become the first person we consult when we have a question, when we doubt, when we fear, when we struggle. Lord, forgive us for human, human ideas of what purity is that are really not pure at all. Forgive us for putting too much emphasis on the outward appearance and not enough on the inside. Forgive us, O oh God, for judging others who don't look like us. Forgive us for unkindness towards, towards people who, who may not follow you and they're hopelessly lost and when we judge them. Forgive us for that, Lord. Give us hearts that are grieved and broken for them, hearts that intercede for them. Give us hearts that absolutely love those who are different from us those who don't follow you, those who hate you, Lord, those who don't even believe in you, give us hearts of love for them. Give us hearts for every definition of what gender is today, Lord. Hearts of love for all of them. While at the same time, Lord, remaining true to you in all things and remaining salt and light in this world. Lord, I pray that you deliver us from striving from striving in our own strength to try to be pure. Forgive us and, and deliver us from constant guilt that we're never doing enough. Constant guilt that it's never enough, that we never pray enough, we're never righteous enough, we never say enough, we never work hard enough. Deliver us from that kind of bondage, Lord. It is not of you and it is not pure. Because we know that there is a rest in you. When we take your yoke, there's a rest in you. So, Lord, set us free today to pursue you with all that we are and help us to live out our walk with you from the deepest part of us, not from an external, shallow part of ourselves. So we speak life to the dead places now. We speak hope to the hopeless, to those who, who are watching this, Lord. We speak life to them. We speak grace to them and strength and encouragement that there's not one person you cannot transform. There's not one person you can't change. Because, Lord, we know that the way the world is today is not the way it is supposed to be. And we mourn for that. And we groan over that. And we, and we say, Lord, kingdom come. Let your kingdom come in the name of Jesus. So bless this day. Bless this time together. And bless those who watch. And we pray salvation today, Lord, on someone and grace on someone. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.